our lab usually studies butterflies from more exotic locations. So we go to South and Central America to collect butterflies. We go to Southeast Asia to collect butterflies. For this project, we're doing something quite different. We're focused on this very common little bland butterfly right in our backyard. Cabbage white butterflies can only lay their eggs on one group of plants. These are the mustard plant family. We eat a lot of them. They include mustard, they include our cultivated cabbage, and these are the only plants that the caterpillars can eat. And so for this study, we're focused on how this plant-insect interaction is going to change in the future. We're well aware that climate change is rapidly changing the environment, and we want to know what's that going to do 50 or 100 years from now, how is the insect going to be getting along with its plant, and are those interactions going to change? So to mimic the effects of climate change, we used environmental chambers. For us, these are really sort of mini time machines where we can raise the plants and the butterflies together under different environmental conditions. So we just elevated temperature in one chamber, about five degrees warmer than what we experience today. And in another, we just elevated CO2, roughly doubling the amount of carbon dioxide in the environment. And then finally, we set a chamber with elevated temperature and elevated carbon dioxide. We had good reason to think that the butterfly's relationship with the plant might be disrupted. Because in a previous study, we revealed how these species have evolved side by side. Millions of years ago, the plants started developing defenses against the munching caterpillars that made the plants taste toxic. But the butterflies fought back, evolving the power to deal with the toxins. The plants, in turn, came up with new toxins. And the butterflies adapted again. This arms race has continued through all kinds of changes over those millions of years, including ice ages. But man-made climate change could happen way too suddenly for the butterfly and plant to maintain their delicate balance of power. And so what did we find? Starting with the butterfly, we found that in terms of the caterpillars themselves, they did very similarly between today's conditions and these future sort of extreme conditions. However, we did find something interesting with the butterflies in that they lay many more eggs under these future conditions. And then on the plant side, that's where things really went awry. If we grow them just under elevated CO2, but today's temperature, they did pretty good. They were happy under those circumstances. But under those future climate change scenarios where it's hot and there's high levels of carbon dioxide, that's where we see a bad outcome for the plants. The plants grew very poorly. And that, in turn, was bad for the butterflies. The caterpillars were stuck on these crummy little plants. They didn't have enough to eat. And then the poor guys would starve. So what our experiment is telling us for the future of this butterfly and this plant, that might still be a little bit up in the air. Because for our experiments, we're locking the insect and the plant together in the cages. They don't have an option to move. But in the future, as temperatures rise, it's very possible that the butterfly and even the plant will actually move where they occur towards the poles as the Earth is warming. So other species are very likely to experience similar challenges to what we're seeing with our butterflies. Natural communities are made up of a bunch of interacting species. And it's very likely that in most natural communities, the participants are going to experience climate change differently. And there are already good examples of this. For instance, birds, migratory birds that fly north or fly south to their breeding ground. Historically, that's been timed to get to those breeding grounds right when there will be a lot of insects to eat. But with climate change, we're seeing situations where the birds are missing the feeding. The insects have already come out and gone when the birds arrive. And so we expect situations like this and what we're seeing with our butterflies to become increasingly common.
All right. Well, hello and welcome to our first Friday series of watch parties about all things Belle Isle and Detroit River related, especially as they relate to the larger Great Lakes region. I'm Anna Seisling, producer for Great Lakes Now, an initiative of Detroit Public Television. So that really awesome video that we just watched called Backyard Butterflies Meet Climate Change came to us courtesy of WTTW's Urban Nature. That is a digital series that explores the surprising slices of nature thriving in America's largest cities. You can watch the entire series at WTTW.com slash Urban Nature. We'll make sure we drop that link into the chat for you. All right, so we have a really great lineup of guests for today's watch party. But first, I'd like to welcome our co-hosts for this series of watch parties. As always, the Belle Isle Conservancy, WDET, Detroit's NPR station, and independent environmental newsletter, Planet Detroit. So if you are a regular viewer of our watch parties, you know that we have a lot of guests from the Detroit Zoo's Nature Center, which is on Belle Isle. Um, so I want to show this little video here. That is our outside of the center there on the east end of the island. And yes, there is a butterfly habitat that's been put in. So there you go. If you are living in the Metro Detroit area, I'd urge you to go and check out the uh, nature center there at Belle Isle. All right. So now, Tammy, let's go back to that cool map that you were just showing. And we can uh, give a special welcome to our co-host for this month's watch party. WPBS TV in Watertown, New York. WQLN in Erie, Pennsylvania. WNMU TV PBS in Marquette, Michigan. Milwaukee PBS and PBS Western Reserve in Kent, Ohio. All right. So at this point, it should come as no surprise that the theme for this month's watch party is butterflies. We're going to be talking all about butterflies, how we can be supportive to their survival and ecosystems, and how climate change is impacting various species living all around the Great Lakes region. And to everybody watching on Facebook and YouTube, of course, as always, please feel free to chat with us and join the conversation as we go here. If you have a story about uh, maybe creating a butterfly garden in your own yard, if you have a question about hmm, what kinds of plants do butterflies like the best, feel free to drop those questions, comments, concerns, or your name if you want to let us know where you're watching from. You can put all that good stuff in the chat. And we are still trying to get up to 10,000 uh, followers slash likes on the Facebook page for Great Lakes now. So please be sure if you're not already, make sure that you are liking, following Great Lakes Now on Facebook. All right, so now I'm really excited to welcome our guest for today's watch party. First up, we have Urban Nature host Marcus Kronforst. Um, he, uh, Marcus, we just saw you in that video. So great to have you here. Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Awesome. And then we have author of Bicycling for Butterflies, Sarah Dykeman. Uh, Sarah made history when she became the first person to bicycle alongside monarch butterflies on their annual migration, a round trip of, get this, more than 10,000 miles. Sarah, so good to have you with us today. Yeah, happy to be here. And then we have Eastern District Interpretive Supervisor with the Huron-Clinton Metro Authority, Aaron Parker. Aaron is an experienced educator and steward for butterflies in the Great Lakes region. Hi, Aaron. Hi. All right. So we are going to, uh, we'll get back with Aaron and Sarah a little bit later, but first up, I want to start with Marcus. So Marcus, we saw you talking a lot about the cabbage white butterfly and talking about the research that um, your lab does uh, around butterflies. So what kinds of butterflies have you, have you studied when you've gone to these other kind of far flung locations to study them? Yeah. So um, a lot of our research focuses on, um, Butterflies from the tropics. So we study um, long-winged butterflies or passion um, bind butterflies from South and Central America. Um, and we also study swallowtail butterflies from Southeast Asia. Um, and so we, we go to these locations and study the butterflies. We also bring those butterflies back to Chicago and we raise them in greenhouses here. Um, but as I mentioned in the video, uh, we have increasingly been working on local butterflies. So we have this project that I talked about in the video on cabbage white butterflies. Um, and we also have a project that we do every summer uh, focused on uh, migration behavior of monarch butterflies. Okay, cool. So um, in doing the prep for this, I actually learned a really cool uh, cool new word or cool new, I guess, area of study, and that is lepidology, which is essentially kind of the study of, of winged insects, right? Yeah, so that would be uh, the study of butterflies, right? 
Okay, cool. So, so how did you, Marcus, get into lepidology? Um, so I became a lepidopterist uh, very much by accident. It was a happy accident, but I was uh, an undergraduate student, at, you know, at university, um, looking for research opportunities, and I thought I was going to study something totally different. And a professor I was working with suggested a project on butterflies. And I was originally not enthusiastic about this idea at all. I, 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 butterflies were not on my radar. It didn't seem like a very interesting project at the time. But I ended up doing that project. And it really opened up an exciting world to me that I've just stuck with ever since. And, and I'm, so an accident, but a, a happy accident. A happy accident. Those are the best kind. Um, so talking about the work that you do in Chicago, I want to make sure that we drop a link to your lab. That is cronforcelab.org. We'll put that in the chat for people who want to find out more about the work that you do. Um, and I want to go back to kind of what we saw in that video a little bit about the cabbage white butterfly. But before we do that, um, I just want to give a shout out to some folks who are dropping in in on the chat. Let us know where they're tuned in from. We have Mike in Detroit, Amanda in Boston, Mary in St. Clair, Michigan, Jeannie in Indiana. And Amanda, uh, Amanda in Boston is excited about this. She says this is really informative. So Amanda, uh, buckle up because I think we're going to all be learning a lot more in the next uh, 20 minutes or so here. So going back, Marcus, to what um, some of what you were saying in that video. So can you talk a little bit more about the testing um, and those kind of simulations that you created in the lab to get an idea of the effects of climate change in the future and the ways that that impacts the cabbage white butterfly? Talk a little bit more about kind of how you went about setting up that um, that experiment to kind of simulate yes. those conditions. Sure. Yeah. So there is, you know, there is a whole field of science focused on um, sort of um, trying to understand what future climate conditions will be. And there are there, there are a lot of scientists that focus on climate simulations and, and trying to estimate in, you know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, under various, um, uh, with various predictions, what temperature will be like, what CO2 um what CO2 uh, emissions will be like. Um, and so we took sort of estimates for the Chicago area and we looked out into the future 50 years and 100 years um, and sort of took kind of average estimates for, for um, atmospheric CO2 and average uh, daily temperatures. Um, and, you know, we realized, well, using these uh, environmental chambers that we have in the lab, we can plug those temperature and CO2 conditions into those environmental chambers and, and look at how the butterflies and the plants respond to those today. So we don't have to wait for 50 years or 100 years. We can look at how the butterflies and the plants will respond um, today. So that's why I refer to them as, uh, as essentially time machines. We can look at those future conditions um, today. So that's exactly what we did for the experiment. And um, it turns out that, you know, as we showed, uh, you know, the butterfly and the plant have uh, fairly radical reactions to those future conditions. Okay. And I, so I want to ask you, I mean, we saw in the video there that um, you were able to kind of figure out that the cabbage white butterflies, they're laying more eggs in these kind of future conditions. So is this sort of essentially a, kind of an evolutionary behavioral change to try to, um, you know, sort of ensure the existence of the species under these different um, environmental conditions? So that is, it, that's a good question. So it, it's not an evolutionary response because again, the butterflies, we're just pulling them out of nature today. We're not allowing them, they're not evolving at all. We're just immediately giving them uh, exposure to future conditions. Um, and so they're not evolving at all between now and those future conditions. It, this is really, um, a just a physiological response to those future conditions. So it is how, in a very short period of time, their body responds. So, you know, the way I think about it is, it is this elevated temperature, the, the metabolism of the insect is higher, certain parts of their natural um, biology, their metabolism, their physiology is just elevated under those higher temperatures. And one of the outcomes we see of that is apparently that they lay a lot more eggs. Mm. So it's not really an evolutionary response. It's more of a, a 
physiological metabolic response. Got it. Okay. I really appreciate that distinction. Um, and finally, Marcus, um, so you have been, I mean, like I said, initially, we've highlighted urban nature um, in a variety of watch parties here talking about all kinds of topics. Um, what was it like, though, to incorporate your work specifically around butterflies into a segment for the series? It was a lot of fun. I mean, it was one situation where uh, I knew <laughs> I knew something about what we were talking about. So, you know, all of these episodes are um, all the urban nature episodes are fascinating. And, you know, every time we were doing a new episode, I was learning lots of new stuff. Um, and all this material was essentially uh, prepared by uh, Dan Protest at WTTW in Chicago. So all along the way, I'm learning all these new things. Now, sort of switching gears and doing an episode based on my own research. This is one situation where I got to sort of be in the in in the driver's seat, be the expert, and really know the know the material um, and sort of lead the lead the process, which was a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, yeah, it, it looked like you were having fun, and it was really fun to watch. All right, Marcus, stick around. Um, I'm going to move on and welcome in Sarah Dykeman, our next guest. But if we have any other questions coming in about that video, about the Cabbage White Butterfly, we'll get you back up here in a minute. And, uh, you know, to everybody watching on Facebook and YouTube, I would urge you, if you have questions, comments, stories about butterflies, creating a backyard butterfly garden, questions about butterflies and climate change, feel free to drop those questions, uh, comments, stories in the chat. I'll be sure to work those in as we go. And of course, if you do just want to drop your name and let us know where you're tuning in from today, that's always a fun, easy way to kind of enter the conversation too. And we do have uh, Rose who says hello from the Wyandotte Transition Program. Our classroom is in Wyandotte, Michigan. Awesome, Rose. Happy to have you watching today. And then from Butterfly Princess on our YouTube channel, a very appropriate name, uh, Butterfly Princess says, hi, just love butterflies watching from the Northwest Ohio area. And Jamie Feldman says hi from Southfield. All right, so now let's welcome in Sarah Dykeman, who, as I said initially, is the author of Bicycling with Butterflies. She made history when she became the first person to bicycle alongside monarch butterflies and their annual migration. That is a trek of more than 10,000 miles. There you can see the book there. All right, Sarah, so super, super happy to have you with us today. How's it going? It's going great. I'm happy to be here. Cool. So um, let's, I mean, I feel like everybody is probably wondering the same thing. To the best of your ability, give us a brief sort of synopsis. What was it like to take this epic journey of 10,000 miles? It was incredible. The monarchs led the way. I, I started in Michoacan, Mexico in, in March of 2017, and I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't have much of a plan and I knew just the bare bones about monarch ecology and off I went and I discovered that there's this incredible network of monarch stewards and conservationists and they found out about my trip and they sent my emails and messages and they said you've got to come to my house I'll cook you an amazing meal I will tell the media that you're here so we can get the word out about how incredible the monarchs are you can do presentations at our schools and by the time I responded to all these emails, my route was this zigzag that took me all the way to Canada <laughs> and then uh, brought me back down to Mexico in November. And I, I stayed with scientists and with stewards and with backyard gardeners and front yard gardeners and learned so much. And yeah, I'm just, I'm so happy to be a voice for the monarch and to share my, my passion and my joy and, and the need to protect them with as many people as I can. Absolutely. So I'm wondering, um, the book came out last year. Did you know when you went on this truck, were you like, oh, I'm writing a book about this? This is kind of like the, the game plan for the, the, the end of the truck is going to result in this book? No, <laughs> I started thinking I'm going to have a fun adventure. Maybe I'll get into some trouble and, and have some good stories to tell. And about halfway through, I just, I realized that so many people had the same thing to tell me, which was that when they were kids, they saw lots of monarchs and that that was no longer the case. And I started thinking, wow, there is an important message here, which is that we are in danger of losing this phenomenal migration. And that unless mm -hmm. all of us stand up and do something, we're, we're, going, we're going to lose this migration. And so I became inspired to not just speak at presentations, to not just talk to 
radio stations and newspapers, but to, to try and really make elevate my voice. And so about halfway through, I said, I'm going to write a book for the monarchs. And that's, that's what I did. And the dedication is to the monarchs. This, the, the book is, is for them. That is so cool. Um, so I definitely we're going to talk more about your trip. We're going to talk more about um, kind of being a good steward to monarchs as they make their way through the Great Lakes area, specifically during their migration. But um, before we continue, you made this video that you sent us initially and you were like, I don't know if you guys want to include this, but I, I found it to be really fun, really educational. You made this a few years back and it's kind of about the relationship between milkweed and butterflies. Um, before we throw to this video, Sarah, is there anything, any way that you kind of want to introduce it? Well, I just want to make science as fun as possible. And so this is a very silly way to explain an incredible phenomenon, which we've already discussed about host plants and relationships and how everything is connected and how if we, if we move one thing or if we tweak one thing, that really affects everyone. So the monarchs and the milkweed in this case are intricately leaked. And the monarch and the milkweed were both the heroes of, of the story. Cool. All right, Tammy, let's fire up that video. As I follow the monarch butterflies on their migration by bike, I'm looking for adults and their eggs and caterpillars on a special plant called milkweed. Now, milkweed is called milkweed because in order to defend itself from attacks by herbivores, it has evolved this milky, latex, gluey poison. This defense stops me from attacking it, but monarch caterpillars have evolved counterattacks. As the milkweeds evolve new defenses, the caterpillars evolve new ways to attack in a sort of evolutionary arms race. Not actual arms. It's more like a race for creatures to arm themselves with adaptations to survive. And it happens at the slow speed of evolution and at the hyper speed of a freshly baked cookie drama. Well, let me explain. First, imagine I bake some cookies and then I put them on the counter and a kid comes by and eats them. Eating in nature is a form of attack, so I put the cookies in a cabinet to defend them until the kid figures out how to open the cabinet and attack the cookies. So I put them higher up, which works until the kid figures out how to climb up, open the cabinet, and attack the cookies. So I lock the cabinet. Ha 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 ha, I win. Da! Until the kid picks the lock, climbs up, opens the cabinet, and attacks the cookies. As long as the kid wants cookies, and I want to defend my cookies, we'll have to keep evolving new strategies to deal with new methods of defense and attack. Now, if we think of the kid as a caterpillar, and the cook as milkweed, then the caterpillar is no longer attacking cookies, but the milkweed's leaves. The caterpillar wants to attack, the milkweed wants to defend. So when the milkweed evolved hairs to defend itself from being eaten, the monarch caterpillars evolved the behavior to shave off the leaves with their mouths and attack. And when the milkweed evolved milky latex to trap the caterpillars and glue shut their mouths, the caterpillars evolved behaviors to stop the flow of the milky latex and attack. And when the milkweed evolved poison, the caterpillars evolved a way to be resistant and store the poison in their bodies. This can be a problem for the milkweed because if nothing can eat the poisonous caterpillars, then there are more caterpillars to attack the milkweed. Instead of evolving ways to be more protected, milkweeds seem to be evolving ways to grow faster. Kind of like if I stopped trying to defend the cookies and just started trying to cook more. And so the evolutionary arms race continues, and so do I but with a strange craving for milkweed and cookies. Ah, I mean, milk and cookies. So cute. I love that. All right. So we did see beyondabook.org there. And I want to make sure that we drop that link into the chat. You can find out more about Sarah's awesome book and you can find out about all kinds of things that she's doing. All right. So Sarah, talk a little bit about, um, I guess, kind of what prompted you to make that video and then kind of that evolutionary arms race. And um, you have, we have some really great photos. So we can uh, maybe show that Sarah, um, sh show one of those photos of the milkweed as Sarah's kind of talking a little bit about the relationship between the monarch and the milkweed. Right, so the, the milkweed is the only host plant of the monarch caterpillar. So monarch adults, they'll nectar on all sorts of native flowers, but they can only lay their eggs on milkweed. 
So if there's no milkweed, then there can be no monarchs. And what's happened is that we have converted lots of prairie and lots of places where milkweed thrived to roads and cities and, and lawns. And that means that every year there's less habitat for the monarchs, less habitat full of milkweed. And, and so I thought if I could ride my bike, I could shine a light on how, how important milkweed is and how important it is that we all chip in and we all learn how to share a little bit of our yards with these native these native plant or these excuse me native plants and native animals so everyone that's watching can find a little spot dig a hole get some native plants and be part of the solution and really invite pollinators and monarchs to to come to their yards and and share their space with, with lots of animals and it's it's super fun to do and it brings the adventure to your own yard I love that. I love that idea of bringing the adventure to your own yard. Um, and you have some fans for this video, by the way, Sarah. So we have um, Debbie, who says, what a fun video. Love it. And um, Mike says, the cookie comparison is great. So there you go. Um, and, you know, I want to point out, too, that monarchs are the only species that eat milkweed. Let's take a look at this photo of the tussock moth caterpillar. You could talk a little bit more about the other species that rely on milkweed. Yes, you know, the monarch is such a good teacher because they pull you into the weeds, quote unquote, pull you to the roadside, pull you to the prairie, and they help you discover that there's just so many incredible animals out there. And these tussock moths, they're called milkweed tussock moths. I call them shag carpet for obvious reasons. They're one of those great examples. They also um, have a host plant of, of milkweed. But what's really amazing is both caterpillar species sequester the toxins in their body, which renders their adult um, forms protected because they're toxic. Monarchs show predators that they're toxic by being bright orange. We call that aposematic coloring. The milkweed tuss tussock moths, well, they're nocturnal. So they warn predators with aposematic sound. And so it's, it's amazing. I could write an entire book about every single creature in our backyards because they all have these amazing secrets and they're all worth protecting and learning about. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, it's, it's so fun to, to discover all the animals that we live with. I love that. That's kind of related to a comment that we just got from Deborah, who says, God made everything intertwined and man calls this evolution. Um, Sarah, do you have a response to that? I, yeah, I think that's totally true, right? I think we can call, we have words to kind of express how we feel about things. And some people use one word and some people use another word, but I think as long as we're recognizing the power of these connections, that's what's important. And I, you know, my, my book is like that. It's, it's half science and it's half love letter. And so I can, I can find the brilliance in both. And I, and I think, and I think um, celebrating however it touches your heart is what's important. I love that. All right. So um, before we move on to Aaron, I just want to kind of finish out with you, Sarah, and ask you. So this is obviously a huge truck. I'm sure you had, in addition to the experiences, the relationships that you already touched on a little bit, what was your biggest takeaway on this truck about how we can be better allies and protectors of monarchs and their habitat? My biggest takeaway is that there's a lot of us, right? Just like a lot of monarchs add up to this beautiful phenomenon, a lot of backyard gardens, a lot of people talking for the for the monarch, a lot of people celebrating the monarch, that adds up to something big. And it's there. There's clubs and there's nature programs and there's just all sorts of resources for people that want to start their journey to help the monarchs. And you can be part of this team and the team is powerful and supportive and inspiring. And I couldn't have done the trip without them. And I'm, I'm happy to add my voice to the collective the collective fight. And we're really happy to have you here uh, during this watch party to kind of, again, just add to the collective conversation. All right, Sarah Dykeman, thank you so much. Um, so if you uh, watching at home aren't going on an epic trek like Sarah, it is still really fun to travel and uh, kind of stumble upon butterfly gardens. I think once you know what you're looking for, you'll find a lot of them. So here's a photo of one that Great Lakes now found in Avon Lake, Ohio. This is uh, west of Cleveland on the shore shores of Lake Erie. Tammy, do we have that photo uh, that we can show of, of that butterfly garden and Avon Lake? All right. Well, if not, if you are watching around the uh, Avon, there we go. Um, if you're watching in the uh, 
Avon Lake area of Ohio. Um, there are butterfly gardens in your neck of the woods. Um, all right. We do have some other comments coming in. Um, Mary says, wonderful presentation in simple terms, planting a seed in our brains. Mary, I appreciate that. That is definitely what we are trying to do. Um, all right. So to everybody who is watching, you know, if you still have questions, comments, we got a few more minutes here. And now I'd like to welcome in Aaron Parker. Um, as I said, initially, Aaron is the Eastern District Interpretive Super Advisor with the Huron-Clinton Metro Authority. She's also an experienced educator and steward for butterflies in the Great Lakes region. Hi, Erin. Hi, good Hi, afternoon, Erin. everyone. So it's been kind of a chilly May, a chilly spring, to be honest, in the Great Lakes area. And, um, you know, I'm noticing the buds on the trees. Um, things seem like they're kind of inching along. But can you talk a little bit about if and how um, colder temperatures or colder seasons like the one we're seeing right now impact um, the butterfly population, migration patterns in the Great Lakes? Sure. Great questions and great observations on a what was a chilly and rainy day here in Michigan um, I'm going to turn this down. Uh, yeah, so butterflies, like just about any other insect, are going to be really sensitive to temperatures. And so um, if you're thinking about a rainstorm or a lot of wind, they're not going to be able to fly. Some moths and butterflies are out and about regardless of if it's 40 or 60. But we are seeing kind of a slower, more gradual spring. Um, some of our overwintering butterflies, so those are butterflies that... Um, Overwinter as adults typically and emerge pretty early in the spring, something like a morning cloak. Those are out and about on our warm afternoons. Uh, but you're right, we're not seeing as much as we would hope to normally by this point in the summer. Mm -hmm. in the spring, so. so, all right, you, you sent us some really lovely photos and um, you're the butterfly expert, not me. Um, so I think let, let's just kind of start with some of these photos and um, have you talk a little bit about the different species uh, that we're seeing here. So tell me about this one, Erin. Sure. So first, I'll just say that all of these are just butterflies that I found either on Belle Isle or in my backyard or local spots. So these are not butterflies that are exotic that aren't nearby. So this is a Baltimore checker spot in those beautiful colors. I saw this one last spring. Um, and I think something to think about is uh, sort of tying to what Sarah was talking about is we all have a role to play. Even if we just have a tiny backyard or a balcony where we can plant a few plants, we, we can support butterflies, whether they're monarchs with milkweed or something like this. You're seeing a couple species there. There's a little um, coral hair streak is the pale blue butterfly. And there's some uh, spangled fritillaries right there, the, the bigger orange butterflies. And if you look carefully at that flower, people will notice that that is one of the milkweed species. And so those are adult butterflies and they are feeding on the nectar on that flower. So we wanna think about planting lots of different types of plants and lots of different types of flowers for, for butterflies all through their life, life cycle. So, and then that's just me out and about exploring. I was butterflying that day, although I think in that photo I have a toad. Uh, so these butterflies like many other organisms can be a gateway to um, understanding and appreciating what lives in our backyards and our even small green spaces in our parks and school grounds. Um, and here, this ties very closely to Sarah's presentation. This is a monarch caterpillar in that classic J shape as it is getting ready to um, go through the period where it's in a chrysalis. And so that is the stage at which it's moving from a caterpillar where it's eating all those milkweed leaves and growing and growing and eating and eating. And then it's going to spend a few days or weeks in a chrysalis and then emerge as the adult. And it's got some beautiful colors there, even as the caterpillar. Now, even in the woods, in the shade, on a shady day like this in the middle of summer, there are a whole group of butterflies. Um, they're very fast flying. They are maybe paler brown colors, not the tropical colors that we think of with a monarch or some of our other big butterflies. Um, and this is a little wood satyr, and you can see those big black spots on its wings. A lot of butterflies like this are not going to be landing on flowers to nectar uh, as their first food preference. They are often going to be landing on sap on trees or maybe decaying um, logs or even things like manure or rotting fruit. And so we think of butterflies as being these very delicate things that land on flowers, um, but there are lots of other things that butterflies will consume as well. Uh, and then I wanted to draw attention to the fact that there are also this whole group of butterflies that we typically 
think of as being night flying and we call them moths, but they're in the same big umbrella uh, as butterflies. And so they also are really important in our backyards and we can also um, have a pretty great adventure learning about moths in our backyards. If you've ever gone out in the morning and you happen to have a street light or a porch light that was left on, often in the summer you can check out this, the space around your house and your back door and find all kinds of really interesting moths of all different sizes and colors that were active all night and are now looking for a place to rest. Wow. wow. Okay. Cool. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, you mentioned uh, this idea of, you know, kind of planting these native perennials, things like milkweed, um, goldenrod. So when is, do you have any idea around like when the best time is to plant those things? So you can really plant some group of plants at any time of year. So you might be thinking about things that you'd like to plant to get ahead of the summer. And you could plant things like um, the, anything in the dill family. So our regular garden plants um, are going to feed swallowtail butterflies, which is a really fun um, butterfly to have in your backyard or your garden or your balcony or to rear, uh, rear with children. Uh, the mother butterfly lays a single egg at a time on those dill plants or carrot tops um, and then rears a, a stripy caterpillar a bit like uh, a monarch. Um, and then that caterpillar will eat all your dill plants, so plant extra in your vegetable garden this year. And then that butterfly will um, is a big showy black and yellow butterfly um, so that can be a really fun one. In the fall, that's a great time to think about things like your asters, your goldenrod, um, some of your native prairie plants that are going to feed the adult butterflies. Um, so if you want a big open flower that those butterflies with their big wings can land on and nectar from. Okay. I, I really appreciate too you mentioning the the dill and that those were swallowtails because I had that experience in my garden a couple of years ago. I noticed I was like, what the heck's going on with my dill? There are all these caterpillars. So now I know. Um, all right. So Erin, before I let you go here, what do you think is the kind of single biggest thing that we can do to attract and protect um, Great Lakes butterflies? Sure. So I think it's a two part answer. The first is to plant a diversity of plants. You want um, things that are blooming from early in the spring through late in the fall. You want to be thinking about what are the caterpillars eating versus what are the adults eating. Sometimes it's the same plant. Sometimes the caterpillars can eat a lot of different plants. You want a diversity throughout the season, but also through your, thinking through your types of plants. Another piece of that is to reduce or eliminate chemical use as much as possible in our backyards and spaces like that. If you think about a butterfly or a caterpillar that's consuming directly from a plant and we've put some sort of chemical on it because we're trying to eliminate other insects, that's going to have a big impact on all of the other life in our backyard. And so if we're trying to attract butterflies, we want to make sure we're thinking about, all again, all of that web that Sarah talked about. The chemical piece is also a part of that. And so we want to reduce that as much as possible. Got it. Yeah. Right. I, should, I should also make sure that we um, drop a link to uh, metroparks.com for people who do live in the metro Detroit area. And, uh, you know, maybe you want to create a butterfly garden in your own backyard. Maybe you just want to go out and observe the beautiful uh, native perennial plants that are already in place at so many of the metro parks. All right. So uh, we'll bring you back in just a minute so I can say thank you, Erin. But um, I do want to point out, so one of our Great Lakes Now team members recently took a trip to visit WQLN. That that is the PBS station in Erie, Pennsylvania, that's been a regular co-host of all these watch parties. So one of WQLN's partners there at the southern, uh, southeastern corner of Lake Erie is the Tom Ridge Environmental Center. So here's a photo that we're seeing here of the exterior. And then here's one of the front desk. It is free to visit this facility, by the way. The truck, as it's called locally, has a lot of really cool exhibits. Uh, when you go to those exhibits, you can learn more about the Great Lakes and the environment and guess what? On topic for today, there is this display about butterflies. So there you have it. All right. So uh, we did go a little bit over today. I really appreciate all of the audience participation and engagement and enthusiasm around butterflies in the Great Lakes. It is about that time, though, to wrap up another edition of the Great Lakes Now First Friday series of Facebook Live Watch Parties. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'd like to bring all of our guests back that we had on with us today. Urban Nature host Marcus Cronford 
Forced. Uh, you can find out more about the Urban Nature series at wttw.com slash urban nature. We have Sarah Dykeman, author of Bicycling with Butterflies. Sarah made history when she became the first person to bicycle alongside monarch butterflies on their 10,000 mile annual migration and Eastern District Interpretive Supervisor with Huron Clinton Metro Authority, Aaron Parker. Aaron is an experienced educator and steward for butterflies in the Great Lakes region. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. All right. And a big thank you to everybody over at WDET, Detroit's NPR station, the Belle Isle Conservancy, of course, Planet Detroit, and our other co-hosts for today. Also, a big thank you to the team at Detroit Public Television. That includes Zach Allen, Tammy Winsell, Sandra Svoboda, Colleen O'Donnell, Mila Murray, Natasha Blakely, Lana Cantardi, and Mary Ogilvy with the Belle Isle Conservancy. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for another fun watch party. We will be back next month. And until then, We'll see you out on the lakes.